Today, I'm exploring controversies from the greatest sunken treasure known to humanity to the mystery of an ancient pyramid and its hobbit kings. Let's take a look and be sure to let me know what you think in the comments below. The Secret Chamber there is an unexplainable mystery deep within the Great Pyramid of Giza. But I'll try to give you as much information as I can since this is Origins Explained after all. In 2016, scientists used the newest technology to look inside the world's most recognizable monument. They uncovered a corridor that leads to a void. Nobody knows what's in the void, and nobody knows what the void is for. The discovery has sparked confusion and controversy in the archaeological community. The most the most important thing you need to know is that the discoveries are real. There is a void, and it was confirmed by two independent teams of researchers. Even legendary Egyptologist Zahi Hawass, who famously refutes any outrageous claims about ancient Egypt, said the void is real. Zahi Hawass called it the most important discovery of the 21st century. The way in which the void was found is scientifically astounding. Scientists used muon imaging, which involves measuring tiny particles called muons as they move through the structure. It's similar to X-ray imaging, but the machines pick up particles that move through solid matter. The imaging revealed a full map of the interior of the Great Pyramid of Giza. Here you can see all the different corridors and chambers in the pyramid. And then in the upper right side, there is the void, blank space. It's a hollow pocket above the Grand Gallery, and nobody knows what's in it. Muon imaging can reveal the void, but it can't show what's physically inside of it. There could be bones in there, there could be a piece of weird technology, maybe it's an old battery. I mean, you could speculate for hours. It doesn't look like scientists will figure out what's in the void anytime soon. The only way to reach it is by physically burrowing through the outer shell of the pyramid. I think we can all agree that cracking open the pyramid like a big stone egg is a bad idea. For now, all we can do is imagine the secrets within. What do you think's inside the pyramid? Let me know in the comments below. The Robot and the Treasure Wait until you hear about the drama unfolding between the government of Colombia, the government of Spain, a robot, and a legendary shipwreck worth billions of dollars. It's absolutely crazy. The ship sank over 300 years ago and is considered the holy grail of shipwrecks. This ship is the San Jose, a Spanish galleon from the 1700s that sank stuffed to the brim with gold, silver, and emeralds. Earlier this year, the government of Colombia announced that they will be funding an expedition to remove several items of incalculable value from the wreckage. It doesn't seem that controversial until you know the whole story. The San Jose was the flagship of a Spanish treasure fleet protected by three warships and 14 merchant ships. They were on their way from Panama to Cartagena loaded with goods. Just the treasure on the San Jose alone is worth almost $20 billion. The ships were attacked by the British right off the coast of Cartagena on June 8, 1708. Its destruction came as part of a much larger conflict known as the War of the Spanish Succession. The war started with the death of King Charles II of Spain in the year 1700. Charles didn't have any children to inherit his kingdom, which resulted in a desperate struggle to control the territories of the Spanish Empire. The British wanted more of what the Spanish had, and they were ready to pounce at any sign of weakness. What better way to hit your enemy than by attacking the ships full of important cargo in the Americas? During the battle between the Spanish and the British, the San Jose's powder magazines caught fire. Sparks must have hit barrels full of gunpowder and the ship exploded, sinking with the treasure and most of the crew. Out of the 600 men who were on board the ship, only a handful survived. Since then, it seems like everyone has been searching for the lost ship. There have been secret missions, private companies, governments, and plenty of lawsuits surrounding the shipwreck. In 2015, the Colombian Navy announced that they had had found the ship. The location of the ship was deemed classified and a state secret, so shush. It was also declared part of the submerged patrimony, so the government of Colombia must protect and preserve the ship and all of its sunken contents. But instead, they have announced that they are going to retrieve artifacts of incalculable value. The issue is that Spain says it belongs to them. The gold was on their ship, which was owned by the Spanish crown. Not only is it property of a long-dead king, but it's also considered a war grave and should not be disturbed. 
Bolivia has also jumped in, claiming that if anyone should be the owner of the gold, it is Bolivia itself, because that is where the majority of the gold came from. The gold can be traced back to a mine in Bolivia, where the Spanish forced the native people to extract the gold in the first place. Then, of course, there is the ongoing lawsuit between Colombia and the U.S. salvage company Sea Search Armada, which claims it found the wreck first, over 40 years ago. They want $10 billion, half of the value of the treasure. Controversial or not, Colombia is going ahead with the project. It will cost $4.5 million and involve a robot removing small items from nearly 2,000 feet deep. The goal is to make sure that the precious artifacts remain part of the Colombian national heritage and are not stolen by malicious treasure hunters and sold on the black market. What do you think is going to happen to all of this historical treasure? Who do you think should get the goods? Let me know in the comments! The Secrets of the Hobbits the story of human evolution has always been controversial and confusing. So, when scientists discovered a bizarre branch of human evolution that proved that hobbits existed, things got seriously strange. It happened over 20 years ago in September of 2003. Paleontologist Benjamin Taras was digging through a cave floor on the island of Flores in Indonesia. He was digging carefully with his trowel when he hit a human skull. The skull didn't belong to any ordinary human. It was small and unlike anything scientists had seen before. It almost looked alien because of its unusual size and proportions. After a few more discoveries in the Indonesian cave, scientists realized they were dealing with an entirely new species of human. The creature was given the name Homo floresiensis, or otherwise known as the Hobbit. This was the most significant discovery of human evolution that's been made in the last two decades. The discovery blew apart all previous notions of the human family tree. It shattered the idea that having big brains is required for evolutionary success. Homo floresiensis also proved that Southeast Asia was a happening place in prehistory. What I mean is that Southeast Asia hosted some of the earliest versions of humans, so different that it almost seems like they belong in a fantasy book. After the discovery of H. floresiensis, leading Indonesian archaeologists condemned the find as unethical. These same scientists stole the bones that were found in the cave, only to give them back several months later. When the bones were returned, most of them were damaged beyond any hope of repair. Could there really be a conspiracy going on here? The bones prove that an advanced human species, which only stood around three feet tall, thrived in Southeast Asia. Seems like they were alive as recently as 10,000 years ago. Local folklore suggests they could still be alive, hiding in the most remote parts of Indonesia's thick jungles. What do you think? Is it possible that there are some ancient species of humans still around? Let me know in the comments! And now for a quick break, because it's shout out time! I want to give a big thank you to Candy McGraw and Shady Lane for supporting this channel. Thanks so much for spending time with us. We wouldn't be here without you. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos about amazing discoveries. We've got lots more of that came from. Finding the Ark of the Covenant Is there anything more controversial than the quest to find the Ark of the Covenant? In the early 1900s, a bizarre mission to dig up the Holy Land in search of Judaism's greatest treasure shocked the world. The mission caused such outrage that people are still angry about it over 100 years later. What most people know about the Ark of the Covenant comes from movies. Everyone knows, thanks to Indiana Jones, that if you open the Ark of the Covenant, your face will melt off. But what is this artifact really? According to the Bible, the Ark of the Covenant was crafted by the Hebrews about 3,000 years ago. God gave very specific instructions on how to build the Ark. When it was finished, the stone slabs with the Ten Commandments written on them were placed inside the box. Also, a little bit of magic mana was added and Aaron's magic staff. Aaron was brother to Moses. With these magical ingredients, the box was sealed. On top of the Ark were two golden angels. The Hebrews took the Ark to the Promised Land, where it was buried beneath the Temple Mount. History lost track of the artifact in 586 BC when the Babylonians arrived to conquer Jerusalem. The Hebrews were sent into exile and nobody has seen the Ark since. Some say it's in Ethiopia. 
and some claim the Babylonians stole it. Another popular theory is that the Ark was dismantled and its gold melted down, which would mean it doesn't even exist anymore. What a letdown that would be! Long after the Babylonians were extinct, the Romans took over Temple Mount in 70 AD. 600 years later, the territory passed into the custody of the Muslims. They built a shrine in the late 7th century on Temple Mount called Dome of the Rock. It is one of the most important places in the Islamic religion. Dome of the Rock supposedly marks the very spot where the Prophet Muhammad ascended to heaven. Not many religious people appreciate archaeologists digging up their most holy sites. In the early 1900s, a group of foreign archaeologists, led by a man named Captain Montague or Monty Brownlow Parker, arrived in the Holy Land. Through trickery and deceit, he started digging underneath Temple Mount in a desperate attempt to find the Ark of the Covenant. It was a disaster from the very start. Parker and his team didn't find anything except bits of pottery and some ancient lamps. Before they could dig deep enough to where the Ark might be hidden, Muslim residents of Jerusalem learned what was happening. On the night of April 12, 1911, Muslims rioted in the streets. It was like something out of an action movie, with Parker and his archaeologists fleeing to a waiting boat and sailing away from the city to get away from the angry mob. Ever since, nobody has been able to continue Parker's excavation of Temple Mount. The Ark of the Covenant could still be there. Moses' actual tablets with the original Ten Commandments could also be there too. The Hirota Culture there was a culture that flourished in Japan 1,800 years ago so weird that you'll be surprised you've probably never heard of them. They are known as the Hirota. Some experts think they may have been genetically related to alien visitors. The Hirota lived on the southern Japanese island of Tanegashima for about 400 years, starting in the 3rd century AD. What's crazy is that nobody in Japan even knew they existed until close to the end of the 20th century. That was when archaeologists started finding their bones. Archaeologists were like, oh, look, we found a completely lost civilization not mentioned anywhere in ancient history. Civilizations go extinct all the time and leave almost nothing of themselves behind. In the case of the Hirota, they were almost never discovered at all. They had been lost, forgotten, and even now, barely anyone knows about them. In 2005 and 2006, scientists realized they were dealing with a unique culture totally unlike other ancient Japanese societies. Archaeologists kept excavating skeletons with deformed skulls. Nobody knew if the Hirota had naturally deformed skulls or if they had been disfigured on purpose. Only in a brand new study have scientists claimed to solve the mystery. Researchers are saying that Hirota intentionally deformed the skulls of their infants to give them oddly shaped heads. You may have seen the elongated skulls of ancient people who lived in Peru and other parts of South America. The skulls of the Hirota are different. Rather than being stretched to look like oblong eggs, the Hirota flattened the back of the skull to make their heads look shorter. There is no other culture in the world that practiced the same type of cranial deformation. In South America, Egypt, Central Asia, and parts of Europe, cranial deformation was done using cloth, pieces of wood, or string. An infant's head was squeezed to force their skull to grow almost in the shape of an eggplant. The Hirota purposefully deformed their skulls to make them flatter and smaller. Another piece of the mystery is that the other ancient cultures of Japan did not practice this kind of cranial deformation. The much more famous Yayoi and Jomon people, who lived in other parts of Japan at the same time, had normal skulls. Was this a cultural thing? Or maybe they were remnants of a new species of human? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments! As a side note, you'll be interested to know that cranial deformation is still happening today. In Vanuatu, tribes deform the skulls of babies to make their heads look more like their deities. In parts of the Democratic Republic of Congo, young girls will elongate their heads as a status symbol. For whatever reason, this tradition of elongating human heads continues to be around to this day, even thousands of years later. Why do you think that is? The Indonesian Pyramid Are you ready to have your world flipped upside down? 
Remember the hobbits I told you about earlier that lived and might still live in Indonesia? It turns out they may have built the largest pyramid in the world 27,000 years ago. Yet again, scientists in Indonesia are on the brink of changing history. The Ganung Padang site has been found to contain a prehistoric pyramid so baffling, a lot of people have a hard time accepting it. The oldest recognized pyramid in the world is the Dozer Pyramid in Egypt, constructed 4,700 years ago. The one in Indonesia is still over 200 centuries older. Just like with the discovery of the hobbits, the scientific community is torn in half. Flint Dibble from Cardiff University said he was surprised the research paper was published at all because he doesn't see any compelling evidence for a pyramid. On the flip side, the scientist who wrote the research paper, which was published in Archaeological Prospection, said the evidence they found is indeed compelling. All physical evidence points to a giant pyramid in the jungle. Seismic tomography scans have shown hidden cavities and chambers underneath the rubble, which could be the tombs of hobbit kings. The Ganung Padang site where the alleged pyramid is located can be found in West Java. If the assumptions are true, this site is home to the oldest known use of stone masonry on the planet. If confirmed, the history books will need to be rewritten. I know I might say this a lot, but this time it's serious. If a civilization was building pyramids 27,000 years ago, the whole game has changed. What kind of proof is really here at the site, though? The researchers used ground-penetrating radar to identify four different layers of construction. They radiocarbon-dated soil samples, identified stones carved using tools, and found rocks arranged in a planned way. Danny Hillman, one of the researchers involved in the study, said the proof is clear as day. These rocks were shaped by the hands of intelligent beings. A complex society was here long before anywhere else in the world. As for who these mysterious people were, that's a little more complicated. I've suggested they were the same hobbits whose skeletons were discovered on the island of Flores, and it is a possibility. Why not? It's already been proven that the hobbits were alive until the Ice Age. They were smart, capable, and likely populated a much larger area than just Flores. Maybe Homo Floresienses had their own kingdom of tiny people who built temples and pyramids. It's hard enough to find proof of civilizations that disappeared 500 years ago. Of course, it's going to be nearly impossible to find proof of a hobbit civilization 30 times older than the Inca. The Controversy of Stonehenge If you had to take one guess as to what the purpose of Stonehenge was, what would your guess be? Would you say solar calendar? Would you guess a holy site for a pagan religion? Or maybe Stonehenge was used as an intergalactic portal where ambassadors to humanity accepted visitors from other planets? I mean, the last explanation is pretty fun. The solar calendar theory is one of the most popular but also the most controversial. For years, scientists have been saying the megalithic circle of Stonehenge, constructed 4,600 years ago, was used as a calendar. But why do they say that? Stonehenge does align with the sun on the summer solstice and winter solstice. So do a lot of structures if you look at them from the right angle. What other proof is there? Some archaeologists have suggested that Stonehenge represents a calendar divided into 365 days and 12 months. They say Stonehenge is identical to the Alexandrian calendar introduced 2,000 years later in the 1st century BC. If true, it would mean the Stonehenge builders had an exceptional understanding of the cosmos. To justify the theory, scientists have to do some mathematical gymnastics. They multiply the number of sarsen stones by 12, add the number of standing trilithons, and mix in the station stones, all while tweaking the formula. A recent study by scientists in Spain and Italy has disproved the solar calendar theory. Scientists Juan Belmonte and Giulio Magli said the theory is based on forced interpretations. In other words, scientists are finding evidence where there isn't any by manipulating numbers and forcing their equations to work the way they want. Juan and Julio don't believe Stonehenge was an astronomical calendar. Okay then, so what was it? Tell us what Stonehenge was built for. They can't. Nobody can. Stonehenge remains one of the most baffling, controversial, and mystifying monuments anywhere on the globe. The Pregnant Mummy a mummy from ancient Egypt arrived in Warsaw, Poland in 1826. 
Nobody could have anticipated how controversial and shocking the mummy would be. Even modern scientists are stunned by what they've learned. And you will be too! When the mysterious mummy arrived in Poland, it came packaged in a coffin. It was kind of like a really morbid Christmas gift, only it didn't have a cute red bow on it. The inscription on the coffin said it belonged to a male priest. Scientists assumed the coffin was telling the truth. After all, why would the inscription lie? For almost 200 years, the mummy remained in Poland's national collection of mummies, ignored and neglected. There are a lot of Egyptian priest mummies, so scientists weren't that eager to spend resources investigating another one. Then the Warsaw Mummy Project was started. The project was aimed at studying all the mummies held at the National Museum. The first thing that scientists noticed when they x-rayed the male priest was that he had no male parts. The mummy had lady parts and extremely long hair. Then came the biggest shock of all. It wasn't one mummy, it was two. The supposed male priest had a tiny foot and a little hand in his belly. So this clearly wasn't a man. Researchers realized they had just x-rayed the first pregnant mummy ever discovered in the history of Egyptology. The little foot and the little hand belonged to the woman's fetus, preserved inside her baby bump. This caused a frenzy among scientists. Everyone wanted a piece of the pregnant mummy. After being ignored for so many centuries, it must have felt good to finally get some attention. Researchers quickly determined the woman was between 20 and 30 years old. She was also between 26 and 28 weeks pregnant when she died. These are all facts, but the controversial part is that the team can't come up with a reasonable explanation for mummifying a pregnant woman. A team member said they don't know why the fetus was not removed from the woman's belly and mummified on its own. The woman was completely embalmed, meaning there was ample opportunity to remove the fetus. There is no other case of this ever happening. Sadly, the answers may never be known. Scientists don't even know when this woman died, though it was likely prior to the 1st century BC. Researchers are currently trying to understand her cause of death, and to figure out who she was and why she ended up in the coffin of a male priest. The Meteorite Arrowhead 3,000 years ago, people in Europe were involved in a vast trading network. The main commodity was space iron. I mean, actual iron from outer space. 150 years ago, archaeologists came across a small, poorly preserved arrowhead in Switzerland. It was taken back to a collection and left alone to gather dust. In 2023, modern scientists at the Bern Historical Museum took a closer look at the artifact. They determined it came from about 900 BC. I mean, it's great, fantastic, a cool discovery, but nothing particularly profound. Their jaws weren't on the floor until the test showed the arrowhead was made from a meteorite. There are objects from the ancient world that were crafted from space rocks. Our good friend Tutankhamun famously had a dagger in his tomb that was forged from a meteorite. Still, such artifacts are wildly rare. Here's how meteorites find their way to the surface of our planet. They enter Earth's atmosphere as meteors. As they fall, they leave behind a bright streak of light. You may have seen it happen with your own two eyes. Shooting stars are space rocks that glow as they burn up in the atmosphere. It's been estimated nearly 50 tons of fragmented meteors enter the atmosphere every day. How the meteorite debris was fashioned into an arrowhead is a little more difficult to explain. Scientists think that ancient people may have been captivated by meteorites. Like seeking a pot of gold at the end of a rainbow, prehistoric people hunted down meteorite crash sites. Then they gathered the pieces. There are only about 55 ancient artifacts that were made from meteoric iron. What's so incredible about the arrowhead is that the iron was traced back to a meteorite that fell in Estonia around the year 1500 BC. The iron was taken from Estonia, traded along a network of merchants, and ultimately arriving in Switzerland. Then it was turned into an arrowhead by someone who had mastered the art of forging weapons from space metal. This is what archaeologists suspect, but they don't really know the truth. How did ancient people figure out how to use iron for meteorites? Did they believe it gave their weapons special abilities? And now that you've heard about it, don't you kind of wish you had an artifact made from a space rock? The Mother Civilization Atlantis is real, reality isn't what you think it is, and all ancient civilizations are connected. 
This is what supporters of the mother civilization theory say. The theory explains why there are so many outrageous similarities in ancient civilizations from the Aztecs to the Egyptians. For proof, look no further than the pyramids. The Egyptians started building step pyramids before they shifted to smooth alabaster pyramids like the ones at Giza. The original Egyptian pyramids looked much more like Incan, Mayan, and Aztec pyramids. For example, the Pyramid of Dozer, built in the 27th century BC. The Pyramid of Dozer is practically identical to the Huaca del Sol, a pyramid built by the Moche culture along the northern coast of Peru. It stood almost 100 feet tall and consisted of over 143 million bricks. In the 15th century, before the Spanish conquistadors arrived in the Andes, King Pachacuti Yupanqui of the Inca started to build the Pyramid of Sacsayhuaman. It took an estimated 20,000 workers, 50 long years, to construct the pyramid using gigantic stones. The stones fit together so perfectly that the Inca didn't even need to use mortar. Why did a civilization on the other side of the planet copy the Egyptian pyramids of 4,000 years earlier? I'll tell you why. Atlantis! The theory of a mother civilization revolves around the myth of Atlantis. The idea is that 13,000 years ago, Atlantis sank. Atlantis was a real city that housed a human civilization that was so technologically advanced it would make the best Japanese robot look like a straw doll. For all of their technology, the Atlanteans still couldn't defeat nature. A devastating flood destroyed their civilization, sinking it to the bottom of the sea. This is the same flood from Sumerian myth, Christian myth, and from Aztec myth. But not everyone died. Many Atlanteans escaped and fled to various parts of the world where they started their new societies. They still had the memory of Mother Atlantis, so they built similar structures and came up with similar gods. They built pyramids and worshipped solar deities. So could this theory explain why there are so many commonalities between ancient civilizations, even ones that supposedly never met? What do you think? Let me know in the comments! The Georgia Guidestones For 42 years, the Georgia Guidestones stood as one of the most mysterious monuments in the United States of America. While not ancient, they were still baffling. The Guidestones were, some would say, magnetic. The stones stood as one of the only modern, unexplained secrets. Tourists flocked to see them, and conspiracy theorists debated who was behind their creation. The mystery will likely never be solved now because the Georgia Guidestones are gone. On July 6, 2022, an explosion shattered the stones. They were so badly damaged that authorities had no choice but to demolish the rest and dispose of them. It's been nearly two years since the Guidestones fell and the culprit has still not been apprehended. Who could have done such a horrible thing? Many suspect it was somebody who took offense to what was written on the cryptic stones. The stones appeared in Elbert County, Georgia in 1980. Six granite slabs weighing almost 240,000 pounds were erected under dubious circumstances in an unsuspecting field. They soon became famous as the American Stonehenge, crafted by the Elberton Granite Finishing Company. The man who approached the company used the pseudonym Robert C. Christian. According to the mystery man himself, he wanted to create a monument that would rival those of the old world. He wanted the Georgia Guidestones to still be standing a thousand years from today. This may have been the first time in history that somebody tried to preemptively create an ancient monument. There is still almost nothing known about Robert Christian. Joe Fendley at Elberton Granite said Robert was a nutcase. Joe didn't even want to build the Guidestones, so he gave Robert an outrageous quote far beyond what any normal person would pay. It didn't dissuade Robert, though. He paid $100,000 to have the stones built. Even before they were unveiled to the public, people were furious. Local ministers claimed the stones had been funded by an occult group working closely with Satan. There were rumors that a sacrifice would be made at the site and that the stones would be drenched in blood. The controversy came from the inscriptions. In what seemed to Christians like a mockery of the Ten Commandments, Robert Christian had ten guidelines for the future of humanity etched into the granite. The inscription suggested keeping the human population under 500 million, uniting humanity under a single language, 
avoiding petty laws, and not being a cancer on the earth. The guidelines were written in Hebrew, Arabic, Russian, Chinese, and several other languages. Now the stones are gone, blown to smithereens. Shocking Cave Paintings Cave paintings of what are unmistakably aliens have been identified as the oldest in the world. The paintings are in Australia, made by indigenous groups more than 80,000 years ago. The paintings haven't been confirmed as the oldest ever yet, but researchers are trying to get an approximate date. They believe the paintings could predate the oldest cave paintings in Europe by a massive margin. But who created these paintings? And why did they draw bug-eyed aliens? Historians say the aliens are Wand Gina. The strange figures were celestial entities to the Australian aboriginals. Just like how the Sumerians told stories of the Anunnaki descending from the heavens to create civilization, the aboriginals told stories about the Wangina. They were cosmic beings that came down from the stars and jump-started human civilization. Cave paintings depicting these creatures in Kimberley are anywhere from 50,000 to 100,000 years old, maybe even older. They've been a huge source of controversy because archaeologists can't get a 100% confirmed date of their creation. Plus, the creatures are depicted as wearing shoes. This has been a big issue because the native population was barefoot and didn't wear shoes. Why would they go barefoot but draw images of their cosmic gods wearing fashionable footwear? Losing our fur Have you ever wondered why humans are the only animals that wear clothing? You never see turtles wandering around in shoes or wildcats wearing tuxedos, although that would be kind of cool. The truth of humanity's connection with clothing is a little gross and a little controversial. The issue lies in the mainstream view of evolution, which is one of the most disputed scientific theories there is. The theory states that early humans evolved from apes, and our ancestors came down from the trees, walked upright, and started to lose their fur. It makes sense until you look at it from a clothing standpoint. Ancient humans lost their fur, so then suddenly they had to take the fur from other animals to keep themselves from freezing? In the animal kingdom, creatures don't typically evolve backwards. If it was cold and humans needed fur, our ancestors should never have lost it. Just imagine if everybody was still as hairy as apes. That one day of school when they check everybody for lice would be a nightmare. To understand why humans started to wear clothes and why we lost our fur, David Reed of the University of Florida has been hard at work investigating. This is the gross part I mentioned earlier. David looked at the evolutionary history of lice to see if there is a correlation with the loss of human body hair. Scientists believe that before humans lost all our body hair, we were probably covered in lice. David and his team looked at the DNA history of lice to determine two different species diverged 3 million years ago. Then, humans lost their hair about 1.2 million years ago. And then, lice evolved to live in human clothing 170,000 years ago. Homo sapiens weren't the only ones dressed up with no place to go. There is evidence that Homo heidelbergensis was wearing bear skin to keep warm 300,000 years ago. Clothes have been around for a long time. They were popular enough with our ancient ancestors that lice evolved to live on the fabric of our clothing. But why did we lose our fur in the first place when it was obviously cold enough that we needed it? Scientists can't agree, and many don't even think that humans evolved from apes. There are still millions who believe we were created as we are today by one god or another. I mean, you have to admit, we are weird. If you think about it, we are still the only animals on Earth that wear clothing to survive. Thanks for watching! Which of the incredible discoveries today blew your mind the most? Let me know in the comments below, and be sure to hit that subscribe button and stick around for awesome older content that you might have missed. The Pharaoh's Medallion There is said to be a mysterious Pharaoh's Medallion that once belonged to the great ruler Akhenaten. You may remember him as King Tut's father and the pharaoh that changed the entire religion of Egypt to worship one god, the sun. The reason the medallion is so mysterious is that it seems to depict the pharaohs being ruled over by aliens. There is what appears to be a great big UFO in the center of the medallion, some kind of oblong-headed alien overlord at the very top of it, 
and at the bottom are some pharaohs along with gods like Ra and Anubis. The suggestion of the medallion is that the Egyptians knew very well that aliens existed. If true, it would lend some credit to the theory that aliens did have something to do with the Egyptians building their pyramids and other amazing structures. It could also mean that aliens had a real influence over other ancient cultures as well. But there is a reason that this is a controversial discovery. Nobody actually knows if the medallion even really exists. Was this really something commissioned by the pharaoh Akhenaten? He is depicted quite strangely in many works of art, with spindly legs and arms, and a large protruding belly, and large head with big almond eyes. His appearance has made many question if he actually was an alien. Unfortunately, no one knows where the medallion is, who actually discovered it, or if it's all just a hoax perpetrated by pseudo-archaeologists. The reality is that it appears as though Pharaoh Akhenaten had a genetic mutation which caused his brain to grow far larger than normal. Based on his looks, his strange DNA, and odd behavior, this pharaoh remains quite the enigma. Monsters on Crete On the Greek island of Crete, archaeologists discovered controversial footprints that suggest some kind of humanoid creature was roaming around 6 million years ago. To understand this controversial discovery, we need to look at the human foot. It is exceptionally distinct. One of the defining characteristics of a human being is the foot. So when scientists on Crete found fossilized footprints of a creature with feet that look shockingly similar to ours, it was quite the surprise. The footprints were made by something walking on two legs. In total, there were 29 prints ranging in size. It was almost the same as ours, except they didn't have enough toes. There's a big toe and then three smaller toes with a heel on the other side. If you didn't actually stop to count the toes, you would think it was a normal person's print. Carbon dating determined the age of the footprints to go back 5.6 million years. This doesn't make sense for a lot of reasons. The cradle of humanity is supposed to have been in Ethiopia. How human-like creatures could have made it out of Africa and all the way to Greece before branching out to the rest of the world would completely change history. What kind of creature was this anyway? It remains a mystery. Whether it was a primitive humanoid, ape, dinosaur, lizard, human, hybrid, who knows? The truth about Pluto. When it comes to astronomical discoveries, nothing gets people going these days quite like Pluto. More controversial than its discovery 90 years ago was its removal from the list of planets. But just what is Pluto and why is it the most controversial space rock in the solar system? It was originally discovered by Clyde Tombaugh. Then, in 2003, a slightly larger planet than Pluto was found beyond Neptune in a region that contains trillions of small icy rocks. And here's where the controversy comes in. Pluto is still thought of as a planet by a lot of planetary scientists. It was the International Astronomical Union that reclassified Pluto as a dwarf planet, not technically a planet like Earth or Mars. And yet Pluto still has moons like any other planet. It just so happens to be at the edge of the solar system, in an area where there are billions and billions of similarly sized chunks of rock. And so scientists had to make a call. They had to define what's just a big rock and what is a planet. Half of the scientists decided that Pluto would be the line in the sand. It was too small to be a proper planet. However, the other half of scientists still to this day believe Pluto deserves its place on our list of planets. Which side of this debate are you on? Is Pluto a planet or is it just a really big rock? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Big Brains A controversial study has proposed a new theory as to how humans developed our big, smart brains. For a bit of background, our brains grew as if they had been taking steroids between 2.6 million and 11,700 years ago. During this brief window of time, and up until very recently, our brains were developing more rapidly than just about any other creature on the planet. Scientists working with the Tel Aviv University believe the reason for this sudden explosion of growth has to do with our hunting style. According to the scientists, as humans hunted the largest animals around, eventually bringing them to the brink of extinction, we found ourselves running out of food. Our earliest ancestors specialized in taking down big animals like bison and elephants. 
These creatures would have provided great fatty meals. But as we killed them all, humans were forced to resort to catching smaller prey. This meant we needed more brain power to catch smaller, more clever animals. The humans who were good at hunting these smaller creatures had larger brains with more brain power. So the brainiacs had more babies and passed on their big brain genes. This is at least what the new theory suggests. It's controversial because there is no way to prove it. All we know for sure is that the human brain expanded from 40 cubic inches 2 million years ago to 92 cubic inches 10,000 years ago. That is a shocking amount of growth. And wait until you hear this. Scientists say that brain size since farming started has gone down to 80 cubic inches. We've actually lost 12 cubic inches of brain since agriculture began. The Tomb of Jesus there are three tombs in the world where Jesus was supposedly buried, but which of these controversial tombs is the real one, if any? The story goes that after Jesus of Nazareth was crucified, his body was placed in a tomb. But when they went to check on his body later, he was gone. Three days after he was dead, he came back to life or was resurrected. That's the way the story goes. But the truth is that there are three tombs in Jerusalem that are all claimed to be the place where Jesus was originally buried. There's the Talpiot family tomb just outside the old city of Jerusalem. It was discovered in 1980 with 10 ossuaries within. Some of the tombs bear names such as Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. It's been suggested that Mary Magdalene was also buried here, next to Jesus who was, according to some, her husband. But that's a whole different controversy for another day. Then there's the Garden Tomb, originally put forth as Jesus' resting place in 1883. This is the most popular spot where evangelical Christians come to see the place where Jesus was buried. However, the guy who actually found this tomb was not very reliable. It was even said that the Ark of the Covenant was found nearby and then stolen. And finally, there's the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Before the church was ever built, there was an ancient Jewish cemetery that stood just outside the walls of Jerusalem at the time that Jesus died. There is archaeological evidence to confirm this. However, it's still impossible to say whether Jesus truly did get entombed here, or one of the other two spots believed to have been the site of his burial. Fetuses and Memory A new study has shown that fetuses can remember things. Scientists have found that at 30 weeks old, a fetus has developed short-term memory. If there had been any debate about whether fetuses were conscious or not, this really settles it. According to Live Science, researchers tested the fetuses in 100 pregnant women. They wanted to figure out at what age memory starts and how long the memories can last. They exposed the fetuses to vibroacoustic stimulation, in other words, a very low sound that causes vibration. They observed the reaction of the fetuses using ultrasound machines. What they discovered was that a fetus would get used to the sound after hearing it enough times. At first, they would react badly to the sound, but after hearing it over and over, they just got used to it. Scientists saw that at about 30 weeks and beyond, the fetus would remember that specific stimulus and not react badly. To summarize the results of the study, Fetuses at 30 weeks old can remember things for a full 10 minutes. At 34 weeks, fetuses are able to remember things for up to 4 weeks. The First Noodle There is a lot of controversy surrounding the noodle. Back in 2005, there was an announcement in the scientific Nature magazine talking about the remains of noodles being found at a Neolithic archaeological site in China. The news circulated around the globe sparking a fierce debate between the Chinese, the Italians, and the Arabs over who invented the noodle first. And as it turns out, that award goes to the Chinese. The discovery of the oldest noodle came from a site called Lagia, which has been compared to Pompeii in Italy. It's a famous ancient city that was abandoned after a brutal earthquake and a flash flood. The flood managed to preserve the city almost perfectly. When excavations began in the early 2000s, archaeologists found strands of noodles from at least 2000 BC. These noodles were created using the traditional method of lamian, of stretching each strand by hand. This technique is still used in China today. The reason everyone got so angry is that each culture wanted to believe they were the inventor of the noodle. 
The Italians are no longer able to say that it was them who invented spaghetti. In fact, it was the Chinese roughly 4,000 years ago. The Bust of Nefertiti The Bust of Nefertiti is a painted statue displaying the royal wife of the pharaoh Akhenaten. It's believed that the bust was carved in 1345 BC by Tutmos, the most legendary Egyptian craftsman. After all, it was found in his workshop. The bust has gone on to be one of the most replicated pieces of work from ancient Egypt. It also helped turn Nefertiti into one of the most famous women of the ancient world. The statue was originally discovered by a team of German archaeologists led by Ludwig Borchardt in 1912. Ever since its discovery, it's been kept solely in Germany. It's been displayed at several different German museums and is currently sitting in Berlin. The reason it's such a controversy is that Egypt has been trying to get it back for a decade. It's been part of an intense argument between the two countries because Egypt demands the statue back as reparation. Egypt began demanding the statue back 12 years after it was taken by the Germans, once it became a wildly famous artifact. But Germany refuses to give it back. It's part of some bizarre protocol. Because the German excavator signed a deal with the Egyptian Antiquities Services at the time, the Germans technically own it. But just how long are these kinds of deals valid for? It's been nearly 100 years since the paper was signed, and at the time no one even knew it was a bust of Nefertiti. Should Germany be allowed to keep an artifact that they took from another country? Or should they have to give it back? What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Animal Evolution A new fossil may have just pushed the theory of animal evolution back 100 million years or more. As you may already know, our planet has existed for at least 4.5 billion years. And throughout the life of Earth, physical life has existed continuously. For most of the Earth's history, that life was bacteria. The big question scientists have always wanted to answer is this. When did animals as we know them today first appear? Scientists now know that organisms began to grow shells, exoskeletons, and become animals about 540 million years during the period known as the Cambrian Explosion. This was when diverse and complex animals with hard body parts suddenly exploded onto the scene. However, scientists have no idea what happened before these animals existed. There is no fossil evidence of creatures without hard body parts. The catch-22 is that animals with hard body parts must have evolved from animals with squishy body parts that scientists have never been able to find. In northern Canada, a geologist and paleobiologist just discovered a microstructure that's nearly 900 million years old. It seems to show a type of sponge creature many hundreds of millions of years older than creatures from the Cambrian explosion. The reason this is controversial is that it could push back the creation of animals to nearly a billion years before today, or further. If this goes far enough back, it could prove that Earth has harbored complex life for almost all of its existence. Crucifixion Nails There are two iron nails that, depending on who you ask, were used 2,000 years ago to nail Jesus to the cross. These nails have been controversial artifacts forever. The nails were found in an unmarked box in the collection of a dead Israeli anthropologist named Niku Haas. According to the Israel Antiquities Authority, Haas took the nails from a tomb that he excavated in the 1970s. However, there are no records that say which tomb the nails come from. Then in 2011, there was a controversial documentary suggesting that the nails came from the Caiaphas tomb, from the tomb in which a high priest involved with the crucifixion of Jesus was buried. It's said that the priest felt so guilty about crucifying Jesus that he kept the nails as a weird souvenir. It's obviously quite difficult to prove beyond any doubt that the nails were used to crucify Jesus. But according to geologist Arye Shimron, there is some proof that they could be the real deal. By doing some analysis, scientists found that the nails contained slivers of wood and bone. This means they were almost certainly used in a legit crucifixion. They were also dated back to around the year 33 AD, which is the time when Jesus was crucified. No one can say for sure if the nails were used in the crucifixion of Jesus, but they were definitely used in the crucifixion of someone at around the same time. New Mexico Mystery Stone 
The New Mexico Mystery Stone, also known as the Decalogue Stone, can be found on a mountain in a remote part of the desert deep in New Mexico. This mysterious stone has an inscription written on it in what some say is an extinct language. The reason that this particular discovery is so controversial is that nobody can agree on what the script on the stone says, or even exactly where it came from. Some say the language is Paleo-Hebrew, and others that it is Cypriotic Greek. Perhaps it is Phoenician, though there has yet to be any proof. The stone was discovered in the 1800s, but not properly documented until 1933 by the famous archaeologist Frank Hibben, who happened to be from New Mexico. Proponents that it is Paleo-Hebrew say that based on a translation by a Harvard scholar in 1949, it is a record of the Ten Commandments. In another scholar's translation using Cypriotic Greek, the inscription says that it is a report from a warrior from the Mediterranean named Zakineros, who is lost in the wilderness and is now struggling to survive. However, it could be that Hibben himself made it up in an attempt to try to demonstrate that there was contact between Europeans and Native American people way before Columbus. American Giants Across the United States, there are burial mounds and remnants of strange grave sites that some say belong to an ancient race of extinct giants. As you can imagine, this is a very controversial subject. The best place to start is at Cahokia. In the year 1100, it was the largest city anywhere north of Mexico. It's currently located in southern Illinois, very near the Mississippi River. The city was built only 50 years before it became the largest city in northern North America, and it was occupied up until the year 1400. At its peak, its population was up to 50,000 people, way bigger than London at the time. There were three major boroughs connected by waterways and walking trails all across the St. Louis area. It was an advanced civilization with organized urban planning and agriculture, as well as arts and culture. They abandoned the site when the climate started to change and their magnificent city was flooded. Depending on who you ask, the people who lived here were literal giants. The claim is that giant skeletons have been found buried inside the mounds at Cahokia. However, mainstream scientists absolutely refute any such discoveries. And this is made more frustrating by the fact that it's well known that the pioneers who first discovered Cahokia attributed its creation to people from across the ocean, instead of giving the Native American people here the credit for building it. From an archaeological standpoint, Cahokia is one hot mess. The giant skeletons apparently turned to dust when they were taken from their graves. Some even claim the Smithsonian covered up their existence. There were many mistakes and errors when the first excavation started, and very little respect for the site. Now it's been a task for more modern researchers to piece together what happened and perform more organized and serious excavations at the site. The Holy Nail Archaeologists in the Czech Republic allegedly discovered a secret chamber beneath the floor of a monastery from the 12th century. Within the secret chamber, they found an ancient box with a gold plate and the words Jesus is King inscribed upon them. When they opened the box, they discovered a single nail inside, about six inches long. The immediate reaction was that the nail had been used in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ when he was nailed to the cross. The discovery comes from the South Bohemian region in the small town of Milevsko. Historians know the region has been inhabited throughout most of human history, all the way through the Bronze Age and Iron Age at least. The place was settled by the Slavs in the 8th century. The monastery was built in 1187 and later destroyed in 1420 by an attack from the Hussites. It's believed that when the Hussite warriors attacked, a lot of precious Christian artifacts were hidden beneath the monastery in the secret chamber to protect them. One of those artifacts is apparently the holiest nail in the world. But researchers do have more to go on than just the inscription. The box was carbon dated and they found it was constructed with larch wood taken from Israel, dating back to about 1290, and also from oak wood from as early as 260. These dates add up with the story. When asked why the secret chamber remained a secret for over 600 years, the discovery team simply told local news sources that after the Hussite invasion, there were no records left indicating the secret chamber even existed. Nobody knew it was there, so there was no reason to look. The Earliest Horsemen There is a big debate over who were the first people to start riding horses. The relationship between horses and humans is long. Dogs might be our best friend, but horses are a very close second. A new archaeological discovery out of Kazakhstan is shedding some light on this ancient mystery. Two horses were found inside of a tomb from the Bronze Age, and they have been dubbed the earliest evidence of horsemanship anywhere on Earth. 
The horses were buried on the banks of the Tobol River, inside an ancient cemetery hidden in the Eurasian steppes. There are about 30 other burial mounds in the area, all of them dating back to the Bronze Age. Radiocarbon dating placed the tomb complex at being used between 1890 and 1774 BC. This is fascinating because the earliest evidence of horse breeding only goes back to the year 2000 BC about 100 years before this burial. But who lived in Kazakhstan 4,000 years ago? It was the Petrovka people, sometimes known as the Andronovo culture. These were some of the first people in the world who raised horses for meat. However, now it seems like sometime after they started eating horses, they also started riding horses. The teeth from the horse skeletons showed evidence that they'd worn bridles with cheek pieces. There were even three pieces found buried with them. What this shows is that horsemanship was already alive and well during the Bronze Age. The people of the Eurasian steppe were already making equipment for horses and riding them, and even burying them alongside humans. It still doesn't give us a clue as to exactly when this began. Kensington Runestone The Kensington Runestone is an intriguing artifact first discovered in 1898. According to the Runestone Museum, where it's currently housed, it was found wrapped in the roots of an old aspen tree, discovered by a farmer about 15 miles from Alexandria in Minnesota. Ever since its discovery, researchers have been fighting over what it means, where it came from, and why an ancient runic artifact dated back to 1362 ended up in North America. The rune stone has also been the source of much controversy. After all, it's been over 100 years, and its authenticity is still in question. The slab of stone is about 200 pounds, with an inscription scrawled on the face of it. The inscription was allegedly left there by Scandinavian explorers from the 14th century. This, of course, would mean the Vikings had explored much more of North America than previously believed. It would seriously change the narrative surrounding the so-called discovery of North America. Unfortunately, the rune stone has been classified as a hoax ever since 1910. Some even say the guy who found it, a Swedish immigrant named Olaf Omen, crafted the stone himself to gain some notoriety in his community. Other scientists believe it's real. And this is the great big debate. Nobody can agree on whether the stone is real or a hoax. And so it's largely been discredited in all historical reports. Medieval Wife Swap Scientists have made a very strange discovery in a medieval religious book. Scientists working at Cambridge's Fitzwilliam Museum were checking out a medieval best-selling book called The Hours of Isabella Stewart when they noticed one of the paintings inside the book had been altered. As it turns out, the author of the book had pulled off one of the oldest recorded wife swaps in the world. He replaced a painting of his first wife with a new painting of his second wife. And as you can imagine, considering this book was produced in the year 1431, swapping wives was a pretty controversial thing to do. The book itself was painted on vellum, either goat skin or cow skin. Researchers had to use infrared photographic technology to analyze the original pigments of the manuscript. What they found was that its author, Francis I of Brittany, had replaced his first wife, Yolande of Anjou, with his second wife. The original painting showed the first wife kneeling before the Virgin Mary. But then something happened. Maybe Francis killed his first wife, or maybe she died from the pox, and he replaced her with a new woman, literally painting over Yolande's face with the face of his second wife, who was named Isabella. And then the manuscript was altered again to make room for the first daughter of the new marriage. An extra page was added to show her painting. Skull 5 there was a skull discovered in the Republic of Georgia that has been dated back 1.8 million years. It's called Skull 5 and was excavated in 2005. But now, after studying the skull extensively for years, scientists have made a very controversial discovery that could rewrite human evolution as we know it, but it might rewrite evolution in a more simplistic manner. What scientists found is that all of the old distinct species of human, I'm talking about Homo habilis, Homo erectus, and Homo floresiensis, may have come from a single lineage that evolved over time. What this means is that they weren't different species. They would have been the exact same breed of human, but they looked different depending on where in the world they lived, what food they ate, and how quickly they evolved. In other words, our own ancient ancestors would have been as different as a Scandinavian from an African, but both the same species, just like we're all the same species today, but look slightly different. The big question now is why didn't scientists see this before? 
it was probably because of the bones. Most of the ancient human bones found from various parts of the world have looked a bit different, and this has prompted scientists to label them all as different species. But according to the team of scientists who studied Skull 5, even though old hominids looked different and had different bones, they were still the same species that first originated in Africa. David and Goliath An ancient artifact that dates back 3,000 years may have revealed the history behind David and Goliath from the Bible. An archaeological dig near the biblical hometown of Goliath has shown evidence of religious practices dating back before the birth of Christ, pointing to a controversial historical connection between the stories of King David and the legendary story of King Solomon. The site of this ancient city is known today as Kirbet Kayafa. It's about 20 miles from Jerusalem and once stood near the Philistine city of Gath. The giant known as Goliath allegedly came out from Gath to face the Israelites, only to be defeated by David and his tiny sling. And while there is a huge amount of controversy surrounding the legitimacy of the David and Goliath story, and of course many stories written in the Bible, there have been recent artifacts that prove some aspects of the story are true. For example, there was evidence of a strong military force inside the city. There were also 3,000-year-old cult artifacts, including standing stones, altars, and shrines, and many sculptures made of clay that were likely used as inspiration for the description of Solomon's palace. In other words, the artifacts here reveal a story that may have been interpreted into the Bible. Some experts even believe David was simply a legendary figure like King Arthur or Robin Hood, and that's why he was integrated into the biblical tale of Goliath. Ancient Stone Artifacts Controversial cave discoveries are suggesting that humans reached North America far earlier than previously imagined. Archaeologists working in a cave in central Mexico found evidence that humans occupied the area over 30,000 years ago. If true, this would mean people arrived on the continent 15,000 years earlier than what scientists currently believe. The discovery includes ancient stone tools, and the hypothesis is even backed up by data collected from other ancient sites. But even though these are facts, some are still skeptical, and this has led to much debate. What we do know is that the first humans into North America came from East Asia. Mainstream researchers are still adamant that they began arriving about 16,000 years ago. Other researchers think it could be as far back as 130,000 years ago. No matter which way you turn, the evidence is disputed. These newest discoveries are a bit harder to refute, though, considering at least 2,000 stone tools have been found inside the Mexican cave, and they all date from between 25,000 and 32,000 years. There are some missing pieces to this puzzle, that's for sure. The Ramseum The Ramseum is the burial temple dedicated to Ramses II. It was originally intended to be the mortuary temple of the great king when he died, but it was also a temple dedicated to Amun. And even though we know it as the Ramseum, the Egyptians actually called it the house of millions of years of user matre seten pere that unites Thebes the city in the domain of Amun. And let's be honest, that's too much of a title for anyone. The Ramseum is one impressive temple. It's absolutely huge. Many of the statues have since been broken or destroyed, and yet the temple still stands against time, even though it was built thousands of years ago. Its outer walls are decorated with depictions of military triumphs and old Egyptian gods. The controversy here is that some people believe these depictions show an ancient war against the Egyptians and a race of superior beings known as the Anunnaki. There is absolutely no proof that the Anunnaki even existed, which is why the theory is so controversial. From a purely scientific and archaeological standpoint, the Anunnaki were nothing but the gods worshipped by the old Mesopotamians, not beings from outer space that warred with the ancient world and mixed their alien blood with humans. The truth is that the depictions on the walls of the Ramseum are not showing Egyptians fighting alien gods, they show Egyptians fighting other humans and dedicating their victories to their own gods. Thanks for watching! Which of these discoveries did you find the most interesting? What are your thoughts on these debates? Let me know in the comments below and remember to subscribe if you haven't already. See you next time! Bye!